somebody else's. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Almost in there. Yeah, I remember that well. He died, didn't he? Yeah. call this public caucus to order. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss two pieces of legislation before City Council. An ordinance amending file of Council number 53 of 2011, which will allocate unobligated CDBG funds in the amount of $281,782.99 to the Scranton 108 loan repayment for the hotel and conference center under promissory note B-99-MC-42-0014 and a resolution amending resolution number 674 of 2000 to accomplish the defeasance of a portion of the principal due under promissory note B-99-MC-42-0014 by authorizing the use of uh, these funds from the City of Scranton CDBG action plans of 2011 and 2012. In attendance tonight is OECD Director Linda Abley. Following Ms. Abley's explanation of the legislation, Council may provide comments or questions in the established order. Please begin, Ms. Abley. Okay, thank you, uh, City Council, for having us. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, introduce the OECD staff. On my far left is Tom Priambo. He's the construction and ADA specialist. Mary Maroon, she is the director of Co uh, compliance and finance. On my far right is Lori Reed, deputy director. And on my next to me is attorney Jim Mulligan. Thank you. Okay. Um, as City Council knows, um, the City of Scranton has a timeliness issue um, spending our CDBG money. And this started back in 2011. It first appeared. So OECD has been working over the past year to start moving stalled projects forward. As you know, um, over the past year, I have presented a lot of um, substantial amendments to Council. We have been going into our IDIS system, that is our financial system, and taking projects that have been stalled, not going forward, and presenting them to City Council to be used on eligible activities. So that's where we are right now. So as of um, September 26th, our timeliness issue is $1,385,757. So OECD staff, were, we had to think of ways how to spend this money without losing it. So as you know, we have a $2.5 million paving project that we moved the neighborhood police patrol and a lot of other projects into that. That's ongoing. Um, however, with the handicap curb cuts, that takes time to design. So we were finding a little, uh, it was taking too much time and we needed something quicker to move forward with. So I thought, well, 
the section 108 for the Scranton Hotel we need to pay that every year mm -hmm. we don't have to bid it out there's no ev environmental review it's just something that's due every year so I called um, Paul Webster down at HUD Washington and I asked him you know is this feasible to make a lump sum payment and he said we could not make a lump sum payment because of section 108 there's investors and you know they invest their money they want to get you know an advantage out of the section 108 so he said we could do a fees a defease account that we would um, they would hold the money for us and when uh, I think you have the the chart like in February uh, 1st 2013 they would release two thousand five hundred and fifty two dollars to pay our payment they would hold the money for us instead of us holding it on to us and November 2nd losing it so that's why I went with the defeasance so it is the federal government HUD it's the federal government HUD Washington money for us excuse me it's it's HUD the federal government that would be holding the funds for us correct it would be the um, New York Mellon <clears throat> they would create a defeasance account there and hold the funds for us and we would be good um, until August 1st night 2016 and that would include because the city of Scranton is responsible for these payments anyway yes they're not going to go away so I thought this would might might be the best way to um, satisfy part of the timeliness problem do you have any questions on that before I uh, from from what accounts and projects were the unobligated funds in the amount of two hundred eighty one thousand seven eighty two ninety nine okay taken? this is a little confusing but I'll try my best <laughs> okay um, to make up the total of the 698 okay Count City Council already approved the three hundred and forty five thousand in the 2012 action plan mm-hmm and we have $71,000 left in the 2011 action plan. However, we needed a, um, or we had to have an ordinance to give us permission to use that in one lump sum. Pay now. Okay. The 281,000, we continually get program income from our revolving loan fund or any other activities that pay us back. I'll give you for instance if uh, we had an activ activity that we were funding hundred thousand dollars for that council approved and we set it up in our IDIS under entitlement however in the meantime we have a hundred thousand dollars of program income from revolving loan funds that we are receiving we have to use this program income first so that opens up that other hundred thousand dollars of entitlement to be used on another activity so we're continually getting funds in but however we have to use the program income first did I explain that correctly <laughs> okay so that rather than that amount of the uh, 281,000 approximately that's coming from the revolving loan fund not CDBG it is revolving loan from CDBG in 2004 we had an activity CDBG revolving loan fund and that's where the money continually comes mm -hmm. back in it, it it's not it has nothing to do with RERE or UDAG okay you can continue oh okay so um, on the timeliness issue we have 1.3 million just for council's information so if we do the 698 and I'm just rounding the numbers off um, right now under construction are um, 16 city streets that should be completed by the end of October and that would total five hundred and seventy thousand seven hundred and one dollars and ninety eight cents so that will help the timeliness 
um, demolition of hazardous structures. I'm waiting for a, a payment to come in for 125,249,000. ,000. And there should be two loans um, going before City Council, hopefully next week, that would both of them total 300,000, 150 each. So if, if everything goes into play like I hope it does, we should be okay. But this has to happen um, by October 25th in order for me to um, draw down the funds from HUD. Why well, HUD um, needed a, a game plan from the city. So this is what I provided them. And I could provide you with a letter that I provided them. This is Evans. Uh, will the defeasance of this promissory note free up CDBG funds, which would have been allocated for Section 108 payments for other projects each year? In other words, I, I believe what you're saying is that you're taking current money and you're setting it aside into an account which will be drawn down each year by the amount due on the hotel section 108 loan. Correct. From now through 2016. Correct. And so uh, it would seem then that each of those years, the money that would have been allocated annually toward that section 108 payment Correct. would no longer be needed. Correct. So it would be freed up to be used yes. in other ways each year. That's correct? Correct. Um, is this the only use for these funds? What do you mean? The, the setting up the account and, you know, the defeasance of, of yes. the note. Yes. After, um, if council passes this legislation, I have to contact HUD Washington and they will begin setting up the account with Mellon Bank <coughs> for these funds. And um, were there any other projects currently that might have uh, been able to utilize these monies currently? Yes and no. <laughs> the paving project we were depending on but it takes so long to design the curb cuts for each street. It was taking, it was too time consuming. And we didn't have the time to um, get all the plans together. The paving that's out right now did not need, need curb cuts. So we didn't have to do the handicap curb cuts, which saved us a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So we picked streets that were in the low income area that did not need. But however, um, after we're done with this paving, we'll continue over the winter designing all the other streets and the curb cuts so we can go out early spring mm -hmm. for the big paving project. Okay, so that, that was the only project that was eligible. I well, I wouldn't say eligible. It, you know, it takes the environmental review process too long. The planning, the engineering, Mm -hmm. We didn't have the time to do all that no, for no, other I, projects. I, I understand what you're saying. I was just wondering if there were projects other than the Section 8, the Section 108 loan for the hotel for which these funds could have been. I asked uh, Mr. Webster at HUD Washington, you know, my first thing, can we pay it off? Because I would have loved to pay it off. Mm -hmm. We could have paid one Section 108 off, but that Section 108 is the responsibility of the recipient, and I didn't want to go that route. Right. So this was the quickest, cleanest way to do it. Okay. And um, is there any uh, dollar amount of interest that would be saved by following this strategy? Repeat that again? Well, on the Section 108 loan. Right. 
I assume there's principal and interest. Correct. And that's outlined. Do you have the outline um, yearly? I don't have it. No. Okay. Like February 1st, our, pay, our interest payments due for two. $2,552.50. Mm -hmm. Then in August 1st of uh, 2013 is the large payment of 190000 And then February, every February we have to pay the interest. And then every August we pay either 190000 205000 215000 so in other words, because we're unable to pay this in one lump sum, uh, we're not able to save any money on interest? No. Well, we don't, um, any interest that our office receives, we have to send back to the U.S. Treasury. Okay. Am I correct, Mary? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Rogan, do you have any questions or comments? Yes. Um, would this affect this year's payment for, I, I apologize, not this year, the 2013, which would be in the um, CDBG money that we're considering right now? No, I, I think I deleted that. Okay. We did, uh, we did put an application in for funding, but I believe I took it out. Yes. And if I, yes, I took it out. So for the it's not being funded in the 2013 because of this legislation correct okay and you know unfortunately we're not going to save it I, I think we all wish we could just pay it off but at least by having not losing the money and having it tucked away so to say to make these payments that does free up money as you said to mrs. Evans correct for, for, for whatever programs we would like in, in the future years correct Okay. Um, that's all I have on uh, that issue. And just uh, the other two um, questions I had were re regarding the CDBG, um, the two that I sent to you via email. Yes. Is everybody done with the Section 108? Well, actually, we, we have a procedure where each council member uh, can ask Just very questions. quickly. Okay. Um, approximately how many yearly payments? Now, I don't have that in front of me. What, what is the number of years that... Uh, we will not be making these payments out of the regular CDBG funds. Um, the last, ho the last under the um, August first, two thousand sixteen, will be the last payment under the defeasance. Two thousand sixteen. So it'll appear in the two thousand seventeen so action at plan. Four, four years. And what is what years. is the total number of years? It cannot go over twenty. I'd have to. I didn't bring the fi that file with me. This is the um, Section 108 that, was it last year, Mary, that we got the reduced interest? Yes, we did refinance it last year, which reduced the interest tremendously. And even with this defeasance, um, I don't know what the savings and in interest will be, but I think there will be some savings because right now I'm paying roughly 10000 twice a year, and I notice on the schedule it goes down to... Um, interest is $2,552 and then it goes down to $2,144 and then down to $4,57.50. So I think there will be some savings in interest by doing this. But uh, again, that interest, <coughs> am I correct in um, what I heard that that interest has to be or a return to the U.S. Treasury? It's not for use by the city? Correct. We don't use it. I think that would be interest um, while it's in the account before we make it. No, it's it. just Is that, that we won't be paying out the interest. Mm -hmm. won't, interest won't be coming into us, you know, money-wise. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was all I had. Mr. Rogan, did you want to Yes. Um, okay. Just the two questions that were posed by constituents during um, uh, two weeks ago at the meeting. I have them. Okay. Okay. The one... Um, from Marie Schumacher, can economic development funds be used to help senior citizens and veterans with increasing city taxes? And when, Ms., uh, when Marie posed the question, she was looking at the economic development application that was submitted for $500,000. Let me say a little something about the application process. Um, in June, 
we have a public hearing OECD and we receive citizens comments how they want to spend the money then the applications go out in June and we receive them first week of August this particular economic development application um, was requesting 500,000 and I reduced it to 100,000 there are certain things that we can and cannot do we cannot take an application and change the scope of work we cannot um, increase it if we wanted to put 600 in we, if it's if they're only asking for 500,000 we can't increase it over that amount so council could decrease the amount funded for the amount proposed or don't fund it at all but we can't change the scope of work now regarding the tax abatement program that uh, Ms. Schumacher indicated an economic development project is a job creation the national objective is job creation the tax abatement project that she was speaking about is a public service for senior citizens and veterans it would be an ineligible activity even if we had an application because the city cannot be a, benef a direct beneficiary of these funds we can't give it to someone and it comes right around in a circle and who's benefiting the city of Scranton or the county or the so it would be an ineligible activity <clears throat> that makes sense when you explain it that way you know it's basically federal dollars going right, right back we, to the city. we can't give it to you and you give it right back to the city yeah okay any questions on that no no that's okay. pretty clear no, that's um, clear. the next one is do you have a list of private funding for nonprofit institutions that have applied for CDBG funding uh, in the application they provide their yearly audit and I reviewed a few of them and they get um, nonprofits get funding from fun, uh, fundraisers individual or corporate contributions investment returns program income foundations United Way grants or rents they don't go into detail but I just looked at their audit now under the emergency shelter grant they need to match the funds we provide them <clears throat> okay that's the emergency solution grant uh, under CDBG um, this, I'm just going to give this for an instance if a nonprofit rents a bus for children and it, it the national objective is limited uh, limited clientele low income limited clientele and there's 40 people on the bus and 30 of them are low income because we have to take each everybody's income we only could pay 75 percent of that bus so they would have to come up with the additional funding and that's just for an example and the additional funding could be other government funding though correct from say a state, right. a state yeah. program or okay. right so basically we just have to look at the audits from each each nonprofit correct okay um is everybody okay on that one yeah. okay um, the next one mr. Quinn he um, asked for five thousand dollars for the housing rehab rehabilitation consultant I wasn't sure what the scope of work would be for that we have a home ownership housing rehabilitation program that's been in existence since 1970 in the 1974 1976 back then we used community development block grant program because we did not have home funding that did not come into it until like 1994 um, I'm not sure what this consult what he'd be asking this consultant to do that OECD does not do um, do you have any idea what I, I was thinking from what mr. Quinn said just the somebody to create a plan for dealing with housing in the in the community with the blight and we and I know there are already are programs and I think what you're saying is it's kind of a function that's already being performed under a different name correct and five he 
said $5,000. Well, it probably costs just to advertise in the Scranton Times between $500 to $2,000 to run an ad. Mm -hmm. And a consultant would not do all that work for $5,000. Maybe seventy five. Yeah. But it just doesn't seem realistic to me. Mm -hmm. We do have policies and procedures in place that's required by HUD that are approved by HUD for our home ownership housing rehabilitation. So I'm not sure. Um, you know, is, is that a program run by OECD or is this a different entity that applies for these funds such as Lackawanna Neighbors? Okay. Um, in the early 2000s, we had a housing program that had six employees. Currently in the housing department, we have just the director of housing and she oversees the first time home buyer program. And um, NHS, Neighborhood Housing Services, is our sub-recipient for our housing, our homeowner occupied rehab program. But we have to be, we have to take an active role in it because we have to oversee it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, and I, I shouldn't be speaking for Mr. Quinn, I think he, he mentioned demolition, like we're demolishing all these houses, why can't we rehab them? Yes. Number one, when we demolish a home, we do not own it. And when we do a home ownership housing rehabilitation, we check the taxes. They, number one, they have to be low to moderate income. They have to live in the home that has to be their principal resident. All their taxes have to be paid, their garbage, their utilities. If their utilities are not, they have to be in an active utility plan with the utility company. So all that's checked before we do their home. Um, demolition, you take a demolition house, we don't own it. It's condemned and the owner does not live in it because it is condemned. So I, I don't think it would work. Now, Lackawanna neighbors, and in order for us to buy it, there are probably so many liens on the property, it would be, be, not be beneficial for us to buy it. If, if there's $100,000 worth of liens on a property, we mm -hmm. cannot, it, it's not affordable. Now, Lackawanna so neighbors, they are our chodo. They take 15, well, we bid it out every year, 15% of our home program has to be go to a nonprofit housing organization and in the past it's been center for independent living that i think they did that in 1994 um scranton neighbors before they merged with lackawanna neighbors united neighborhood centers um i think we don't have that many chodos but lackawanna neighbors she looks for a house anywhere in scranton that doesn't have a lot of liens on it she purchases it, rehabs it, let abatement, and then it's resale to a first time home buyer. And that has been working very good. Mm -hmm. So taking a house that's ready to be demolished, I'm not sure if that would work. Because of the liens, we don't own it. It's not owner occupied. And I'm assuming that uh none of the federal funds could be used to pay those liens for the purchase of no. the property. No. Councilman Rogan, do you have any other questions? No, that's it. Thank you for coming in. Councilman McGough? Nothing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Councilman Joyce, any questions or comments? Yes, uh, just one. Um, going back to what Councilman Rogan said, the uh, Section 108 loan for the Hilton isn't in this year's action plan. Assuming this legislation wasn't passed, an allocation would have to be made in the action plan for that loan, correct? Correct. Um, I believe we have enough um, 
We have 345, we always funded Section 108 a little more in case the unknown happened, especially with maybe Scranton Mall Associates. If someone doesn't pay, we are responsible to pay. So we always have to be sure we have enough money set aside to pay our Section 108s because we do not want to be in default with HUD. Um, it, we have 345000 that you have approved in the 2012 action plan. So we would have enough money to get us through another year. <clears throat> but then we have our timeliness problem. Yes, as far as the timeliness problem, when would you suggest that 6A would have to be passed by in order for everything to collaborate and be fine with this? Well, as I said before, as of September 26th, we still have to spend and disperse $1,385,757 by, I'll say, October 25th to be timeliness. <clears throat> so if you do not pass this, you know, I, I'm going to, I don't know where we're, we may lose, HUD's just going to take it. Right. So I would rather put it towards a project that we have to pay anyway. Right. Understood. Okay. That's all. Uh, can you speak to, or someone on the panel, I'm looking at the uh, resolution, and it cites $3 million with the registered holder after Watch and Company as security for an advance of monies from the U.S. Federal Department of HUD for the Hotel and Conference Center project. Um, can you explain that or speak to that, please? The three, th the three million? Mm -hmm. That was the total, I believe that was the total amount of the Section 108. Back in 2000. Resolution, um, let's see, I have a couple of them here. Yeah, that, that predates all of us. Yeah, Resolution 686, 2000. Um, the so the council passed $3 million okay. for the Section 108. Yeah. And as you'll see in um, the, the resolution at the bottom where we refinanced, Resolution 49-2011 where we refinanced it to mm -hmm. get the reduced interest. Thank you. Um, just one last request. Uh, do you have anything else, Mr. Joyce? No, that okay. is all. Um, <coughs> can uh, OECD please once again send to City Council monthly reports on uh, the loans? Are you just interested in the loans? Where I am primarily interested in the loans, okay. yes. Okay, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> because um, September 2009, I sat before you and you asked me to provide you with monthly reports. And I, had, I did that faithfully up until September 2011. And it would take the staff of OECD approximately two and a half to three days to prepare. And we would give City Council, it was a nine-page letter every month of every activity we were working on where it stood. And I thought it was a very detailed report. Yes. And in fact, we were proud of it. <laughs> but if you just, so you just want the, the loans? Yes. And you will have that information in the caper at the end of the year. That information is always in the caper. City Council does have that information. You print, that's in the paper, correct? In the spreadsheets? I'd have to look. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, our concern is that, you know, some of the loans that had been 
uh, provided through OECD, unfortunately, um, have defaulted. Uh, we receive a number of questions from those who attend city council meetings and by email from city residents regarding loans that have been made throughout the year. And we are unable to respond because we don't know the status of the loans. Uh, if they are closed, if they've been satisfied, if they're in default, if when the last payment was made, who's making the payment now, if, for example, the, uh, the property would have been sold or auctioned off or, you know, whatever the situation might be. So we, we need the information so that we can better serve the residents and respond to their questions. Okay. Do you have anything to add? No, not really. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your participation, and particularly for uh, bringing your entire staff with you. It was a pleasure to meet all of you and to uh, have you attend this public caucus. And if there's nothing further, this public caucus is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who have died in our community, particularly Jim Williams Sr., loving husband, father, grandfather, and president of the Scranton Zoning Board, and his dear family and friends who suffer his loss. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Lascom? Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order, 3A, applications along with decisions rendered by the Zoning Hearing Board on Wednesday, September 19, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, 
distributed funds comparison from the single tax office for 2011 and 2012. Are there any comments? Yes, I'll elaborate more on this during motions. Anyone else? Document received and filed. 3C, Subdivision and Land Development Evaluation from the Lackawanna County Planning Commission received September 18th, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, Minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held August 22nd, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, Agenda for the City Planning Commission meeting to be held September 26, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Are there any clerk's notes this evening, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Just one, uh, just a reminder that this coming Sunday is the Steamtown Marathon. It starts at 8 o'clock in Forest City. Uh, the first runners should be arriving in downtown Scranton somewhere around 10 and following up, up until probably about 2 o'clock. But the winners should be coming across at about uh, 10, 20, 10, 30. So if you'd like to go and see the end of the race, please uh, come to downtown Scranton and uh, see a great event. Thank you. I would just like to comment on a, an article that was in the, the newspaper. Um, several Scranton cops honored for heroism at fire scenes. And I would just like to uh, honor them by name during the meeting. Um, it says, honored at the 7th Annual Valley Preferred Spirit of Courage Award, celebration at Lehigh Valley Hospital in Bethlehem, where Corporals Robert Stanick and Thomas McDonald and Patrolman William O'Brien, Francis McLean, Chris Kashunas, Joseph Carney, and Daniel Schaffer. So we thank them for, for all that they have done for the community. And if you read either in the newspaper, and I believe it was on WNEP as well, um, the stories running into burning buildings without any apparatus, any safety at all, be just as one of us ran in right now, they didn't have any protective gear on as well. And they, they certainly um, deserve to be honored for their, their heroism. Um, secondly, as Mrs. Evans mentioned during the prayer, um, I was deeply saddened at the passing of Jim Williams, who was a close friend of mine. Um, he will be missed in the community. He was a, a, a great person, a mentor of mine, and somebody who always uh, stood up for what he believed in. And it, it'll be a, a great loss to the community. That being said, with a vacancy on the zoning board, um, I urge any residents who are interested to contact either myself or the city clerk's office, and I will report back to my colleagues on filling the remainder of uh, Mr. Williams' term. And that is all. Thank you. Mr. Joyce? No. Uh, Councilman Loscombe is unable to attend tonight's <coughs> meeting due to illness. Solicitor Hughes is unable to attend because he is recuperating from eye surgery. Um, as my colleagues stated, Mr. Williams served as a dedicated member and president of the Scranton Zoning Board, and due to his passing, uh, there is a vacancy on the board that Scranton City Council must appoint to complete his term. Uh, therefore, I would say we will accept letters of interest to fill the position in the office of City Clerk, City Council from Friday, October 5th through Monday, October 15th, 2012 at 4 p.m. The Scranton Lackawanna County Taxpayers Association We'll meet on Tuesday, October 9th, 2012, at 6 o'clock p.m. in Scranton City Council Chambers. Lorraine Cummings, Republican candidate for Congress, will address the group. The, me the meeting will be broadcast live on Channel 19 by ECTV. The Out of Darkness Community Walk for Suicide Prevention will be held on Saturday, October 13th at Courthouse Square in downtown Scranton. Registration is from 8 to 9 a.m. and the walk program begins at 9 o'clock a.m. 
You may also register at outofthedarkness.org. <coughs> Saints Peter and Paul Fall Festival and Bazaar will be conducted on Sunday, October 14th, from noon to 5 o'clock p.m. in the Church Hall, located at 1309 West Locust Street in Scranton. Delicious homemade pierogi, haliski, kielbasi potato pancakes, clam chowder, wimpies, roast beef sandwiches, and hot dogs will be served. And takeouts are available from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. In addition, the festival features a $1,000 raffle, specialty baskets, Portuguese delicacies, Wheel of Fortune, Try Your Luck gift certificate stand, children's corner, baked goods stand, and a warm, welcoming autumn atmosphere. Everyone is invited to attend this fun-filled event. And that's it. Fourth order, citizens' participation. Our first speaker this evening is Dennis Burke. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Material here. If anyone is not aware of the situation that I'm dealing with on Lake Scranton Road, if you'd like to see this uh, photos, I'd be happy to share them with you. Certainly. We'll Can take I approach? It. Yes. Absolutely. First photo will show you the path across Lake Scranton Road, and this is the road that has been created. And you can see the truck <coughs> road in that photo as the truck continues down this one would say is headed to the clean landfill it could have been headed to GE's report mm -hmm. these are sample photos taken from either my driveway or my front porch there's one and there's a few more they were all taken on the same day thank you may I address the council Yes. I'd like to begin with a somewhat twisted version of one of Shakespeare's more famous lines. I've come tonight to praise Caesar, not to bury him. Last month, after my wife and I finally reached the end of our patience and tolerance, we decided to publicly protest the overwhelming amount of truck traffic on Lake Scranton Road. We feared we would encounter all types of bureaucratic roadblocks along the process we could not have been more incorrect. I'm here to say thank you, not to the owners of the businesses that have chosen to send their trucks across Lake Scranton Road for the past two years, violating basic rules of common sense and common decency to your neighbors, but to the following city departments and their staff. First, thank you to the Scranton Police Department, especially Patrolman Thomas Lee, Corporal Richard Bachman, and Acting Chief Captain Graziano. Officer Lee and Corporal Bachman responded on September 20th after I was threatened by one truck driver and harassed by another. I was taking pictures for my tax assessment appeal in my driveway. Uh, one second. They witnessed truck after truck pass by as they handled my situation and included their observations in their reports. Their concentrated efforts at the direction of Acting Chief Graziano have resulted in some relief of the truck traffic. Thank you to the City Council, especially Mrs. Evans and Mr. McGough and their clerical staff, Nancy Craig, Kathy Carrera, and Jamie Marciano. In 2010, City Council had become aware of the truck's traffic problem and did everything in their power to rectify the situation. The problem was not resolved at that time, but it was not because of lack of effort on the part of City Council. Council staff supplied me with all the information I needed to present my complaints clearly with a paper trail of Council's efforts in 2010 to Mayor Doherty. Mrs. Evans sent me an email expressing her concern, and Mr. McGough, who was well aware of the situation and the condition of Lake Scranton Road, listened to my complaints and assured me he would speak with the other council members. Thank you to Stephanie in the mayor's office. She assured me that the mayor would review my complaints and contact me as soon as possible, which he did. Last but not least, thank you, Mayor Doherty. You took the time to call me and explain what needed to be done by your department heads to post Lake, Lake Scranton Road with traffic signs restricting truck traffic. 
As of today, my wife and I and other residents of Lake Scranton Road have to, and I must take another play line, rely on the kindness of strangers for our peace and quiet. These strangers are the business owners Mayor Doherty recently contacted and requested to minimize the truck traffic on Lake, on Lake Scranton Road until the road signs are installed. These same business owners reside on Elmhurst Boulevard or in and around Mount Margaret. I see them travel Lake Scranton Road, the road their trucks have destroyed almost every day, on their way to and from their places of business, apparently unconcerned about the inconveniences and stress their trucks create. Ironically, at 12.10 this afternoon, when I sat down at my computer to compose my thoughts for this evening's meeting, I was interrupted by the all too familiar roar of a diesel tractor and the incredible noise a triaxle truck makes as it bounces down a city street riddled with potholes and temporary patches. 20 minutes later, I heard the same litany of noises as the same truck made its way back to Music Street. <coughs> Today, the strangers chose not to be so kind. I look forward to the council meeting I will attend to announce that the traffic signs were installed and that our problem has finally been resolved. A final thank you to everyone concerned. And if I can answer any questions for the council, I'd be happy to. May I just comment to uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Burke? Uh, or what he said. Um, a lot of people probably are not aware of the, the situation on Lake, Lake Scranton Road. Probably many people are not aware of, maybe even where it is. Uh, but um, I, from personal experience, uh, I do know that uh, the residents of that area have been um, disturbed by the, the frequency of the traffic on that road. And I, hopefully we can do something to relieve that. Um, the second thing that uh, Lake Scranton Road, uh, all of the properties along there have no sidewalks. A and yet it does get a lot of pedestrian traffic uh, from people walking out to the bus stop or out to the lake. Um, Personally, uh, we run that road uh, on a pretty frequent basis, and uh, it is dangerous uh, with the amount of truck traffic that is on there, uh, to, to pedestrians as well. And the last thing, the, the road itself has, is very narrow and pretty much has been destroyed over the years by um, the, the traffic that is on it. Uh, you're right, it, it, it's, it's hazardous just driving a car along it at times with the potholes and the, um, the shoulders being destroyed. So hopefully we can take care of those problems and uh, you know, rectify the, you know, the situation for you. And I just wanted to add that, and I, I know that you're aware of this, uh, Mr. Burke, but I had spoken uh, with the mayor about this situation and we agreed that legislation uh, should be drafted and passed by council that would uh, stop truck traffic of this nature on Lake Scranton Road entirely. And at this time, I am awaiting the legislation to be submitted to city council from our city's legal department and uh, I think we can safely say that council members will pass that legislation. And I could not be, I could not be more appreciative because it's been a long two years. Oh, I know, and I remember. I remember this situation all too well from 2010. And it really was a shame that somehow the ball was dropped and for some reason uh, the, the proper procedures <coughs> were not applied at that time, but we certainly intend that it's taken care of now. And thank you. I realize all your efforts back in 2010 and appreciate your current efforts, too. You're very welcome. Okay. It's our job. Anything else I could uh, provide for you? May I take my materials and leave the podium to somebody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Ron Elman.
Yeah, Council, I'm glad to see everybody feeling better. Maybe you, you feel better if I apologize for saying you never hear me when I talk. <laughs> yeah, everybody eats some words once in a while. Last week, there was a vicious attack on Council in the editorial page uh, by Dr. Albert Velarde Jr. Now, I'll go take this step by step. He lives in Music. He just badmouthed the city from end to end. This is where his patients come from. He has an office on the 1800 block, Mulberry. You following me? Mm -hmm. Now, there's an Albert Bellardi Sr. that's a doctor, got an office seven at Mercy at 745 or whatever it is, Jefferson. There's another doctor there with him, Dr. Brennanton or something, in the same office. Now guess what these people using the hospitals have in common? Three doctors, they're under the nonprofit list. The offices in the, in the hospitals are listed in nonprofit. Now, who allowed this? This, this, is, this is just senseless. That's why you can't make payroll. I know you must have looked under the, the nonprofits, Scranton, and, and the computers. I, I go to the, the New Penny Lounge. It's listed as a nonprofit. It's not a private club. You walk in and out of there. How can a bar be a nonprofit? There's bunches of them. That's, that's what's wrong with this. It's who allowed all this to happen? A hundred nonprofits that are just nothing but pure phonies. You know, Sister Adrian, like I've said, that's a nonprofit. She doesn't do nothing but help people. And, and the Progressive Center, and the, I like the McDonald House where you could go. They're nonprofits. Ninety-nine percent of these nonprofits are just hiding behind the, it. Well, here I go again. They're just not nonprofits. They did not fulfill the five obligations that are on the not pure nonprofit charity act. I'd like to see how those doctors' offices can fulfill that. It, I don't know. I know you heard that from me. You know, right, right, uh, I think it was Wednesday's paper or Friday's paper or something. There were three articles from, from in the letters to the editors attacking the, the people and for the university. The first one, the guy said he's had enough. You know, I don't know where he's been. He, he, he didn't. He, he doesn't know what goes on at these meetings. The second one was some some lady up in Oliphant. She says how, all the good that the, the university has done up in the hill section and cleaned it up. See, she doesn't know what she's talking about. They were the biggest at one time, and they still might be, slumlord. They owned half the slum houses up there that were rented to students. They still might be the biggest slumlord. And the other one, this Francis that writes every week, and he wrote such a ridiculous letter about counsel. It's not worth anything. The, the Achilles heel, again, of the university is bad publicity. They have recruiters going to parents' houses, talking, trying to get future students. They do not want to have any adversities. That is where you get them. That is the, the, that is the weak spot. They need to be bombarded with the truth, what they've done. If anybody had talked to some of these people that have lost their homes, you know, that's everybody's dream is having a home. And I've talked to several of them over the years, probably 15 people, 20 people that, that have lost their houses. 
it, it's, it's a heartbreak. There's probably 3,000 or more houses and, and people that haven't paid for their houses lost because of the tax base. And, and then we go to the school board. I talked to Mr. King on the phone the other day for a couple of minutes. He very kindly uh, phoned me back about a, a matter. That school board is hurting because this university has, has deprived them of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I think everybody in the city is just sick and tired of hearing about their good they do. They're nothing but a phony business hiding behind the guise of nonprofit. You know, I'm glad you finally drew the line in the sand about this because it was bound to come sooner or later. Somebody had to, had to go against them. Oh, thank you, Mr. Elman. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's coming. Uh, it, it, it's just so irritating to me we, to have the biased letters in the newspaper. I've written them. They don't print my letters. He told me not to. Uh, Pat McKenna told me not to. But when he won't print a letter of mine because it's it's opposite his beliefs that he is censoring me and censoring is one of the worst thing a newspaper can do and that's what Pat McKenna does to me <coughs> you know I'm not supposed to be censored because he doesn't agree with me he won't print a single letter I, if I if I print if I wrote a letter saying how good he was he would he wouldn't print it thank you please I hope the people out there will, will give you guys some more support I mean, you're going to need it because you're going to have a battle on your hands. I hear things from the... <laughs> Tough road ahead, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we Thank have you. to move on. Thank you. Bob Bolas. Good evening, Council. Bob Good Wallace, evening. Scranton. Good evening. One thing I'd like to ask on the agenda on 7A, where is Mount Lake Estates? Is that up on East Mountain? I mean, I'm just curious where it's at. I don't have the back up in front of me. We can get it, though. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, it says, it is the desire of the Council of the City of Scranton that Kimberly Drive, Tracy Lane, and a portion of Mountain Lake Road along two open space parcels on Mountain Lake and a stormwater detention pond serving the Mountain Lake Estate subdivision be accepted as a public improvement to be maintained as such. And uh, the subdivision plans are recorded in the Lackawanna County Recorder of Deeds records in map book 6 a.m. at pages 4508 and 7052. Oh, that is the portion, Mrs. Evans, on East Mountain, the top of East Mountain then. Okay, one of the issues there, you know, the city took over streets there years ago. They plow them and everything else, but when people, especially elderly, used to park there to walk down to uh, Lake Scranton, got all posted. They put up rocks up there. They stopped everybody from using it. But if we're taking it over, and it's a private development really up there, it's almost like a gated community, people should have a right to park there. Not have no parking signs all up and down the road there where people have to go park in the firehouse. In inclement weather, they're walking up there, it's slippery and everything else. I mean, if we're going to take it and our tax dollars are going to be taken over and maintaining their facility, then the people should have a right to use it. 
park up there and walk down to the lake or whatever it may be. But they basically, uh, even though there's no gate, they made it a private community and we're paying for it. So that's something I think council should look at before they pass this ordinance, that if we're paying for it, everybody should have a right to park up there and walk down, especially our elderly. Uh, getting on, <clears throat> what I need here is on East Mountain, a couple weeks ago I asked uh, if anybody would contact Paul Kelly and get a response from him regarding the 16 and a half foot deeded waterway up there that we put a $50,000 offer on and uh, I haven't heard anything on that. Has council heard anything from Paul Kelly as to the real ownership of this property or if something's been done under the table without telling us what the deed to it? Because I had submitted the uh, deeds and everything that showed the city owned it. I, I know we haven't heard anything. Okay. Well, I think it's time to uh, get Paul Kelly uh, to be held accountable. You know, we have to look at it. You increase the tax base, you decrease the tax rate. You know, we're becoming the laughing stock, literally, the country. And the nonprofits uh, sitting here in the papers saying it's grant and council shouldn't review the zoning board or variances. I think is ludicrous for anybody out there to think that we have a council that should bury their head in the stand and let rubber stamping go on as it did traditionally in this city and especially with the university as we know it's a bully with money. They have tremendous influence. They buy and they control whoever they want. They've been controlling the people in this city. They put sidewalks in. How many times have any of us walked on the sidewalk up there? Very likely, none of us. But it's for their students and their own personal uh, investment that they put there. Millions of dollars in a new uh, center, it's empty, but they're gonna fill it, and they do that because they're a business. Yet they want us to continue to pay for restaurants that they make profit on. They pay sales tax, I'm sure, on the product that they sell. So I think council, because you're standing up, is getting a bad rap from newspapers, from organizations outside of Scranton. Let them come here and really see what was going on in this city before you guys took over as a majority. Things were a lot different. If you knew somebody, you played a game, you got something done here. And you got away with a heck of a lot and they're continuing. A million eight, a million nine for a building the other day. Don't tell me it's a business not making money. They're throwing millions around like it's going out of style. And we're the ones paying the price. We sent fire trucks there. We get a token amount of money. Well, it's time to go back, put legislation into the mayor, let them renew knew it or reject it. You need to start charging for your police and fire department. What the fair rate out there is. Not a token 50 here or 100 there. You need to know what your police department costs you, your fire department costs you. Look at the overtime rate. Just out sourcing, so to speak, our police car is going out on an accident or to a fire or a fire truck there at what they're entitled to be charged. Minimum two hours, you would have made more money than you would know what to do with to cover the overtime cost and handle and upgrade the equipment that we need to do there. So, you know, these are things we need to look at. You're letting this leachate line go unattended. Tons and tons of mud are now coming into that landfill. They're processing and treating. It's coming through the leachate line. The sewer authority gets the opportunity to charge them. That's what they do. They're an authority. They could do that. But that line runs through Dunmore and Scranton, through our property, not the sewer authority's property. You need a charge for that leachate line running through here as a host community. You could bring in millions of dollars, 1% fee, and you could create a fee, a generalized fee that covers just about anything you want to throw into it and pass it across everybody in the city. So you're not singling out the bullies. You're taking everybody on. You take 1% and you're bringing in millions of dollars. And it's right in front of you. We've been talking about it for eight, 10 years. It's time. You're the majority. You can make things happen. 
Time to put politics to the side and worry about the people in the city because we are heading down a slippery slope. And you want to look at the U, look at the hospitals. They were nonprofits for years. Now they're paying. We're getting something for our money. Big difference when you get income brought into the city and you start looking at it. It's what makes the city grow. What makes it prosperous are the people in the city, but the things that happen. And you've got to create an atmosphere. You've got to create an environment that people want to come here and do business. People don't want to build here. They want to run as far from here as they can with the tax base and everything else. You could turn that around tomorrow and make a major difference that people will want to come here and build. Utilize your assets. That's how you make your money. Don't utilize everybody else's assets, and that's the taxpayers giving up what they're giving up, ready to pay $4 a gallon for gas. Use the assets the city could control. The police, the fire, the DPW, the leachate line, the gas line, the nonprofits. Generalize it, and you're bringing millions of dollars in here, and you're showing progress, you're showing prosperity, and you're showing what it takes to put back to our politics to the side. And Scrant will grow again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to begin with uh, recent uh, comments that have been made over the last few weeks uh, in dealing with the University of Scranton uh, in relation to their lawsuit and a few other issues that were addressed uh, at our last meeting. Um, obviously, at this point in time, we're made well aware that the university did file the lawsuit over the parking tax, as they feel they should be exempt from it as a nonprofit uh, institution. But we are full, full, well aware of the fact that they are a business that generates millions of dollars each year, and certainly, as we've uh, we've talked about for quite some time now, have the ability to pay their fair share, and yet they refuse to do so. Uh, you know, last few days, weeks, I should say, Attorney Hughes uh, has come into some criticism for his um, recommendations to counsel at our last meeting in terms of dealing with the university uh, relating to the lawsuit and other matters. His suggestion to counsel was to suggest to the zoning board uh, to deny any uh, variances that they may seek in the future. Uh, and today in the paper, we were made aware in an article that the Pennsylvania Association of Nonprofits had quite a few objections uh, to Attorney Hughes's recommendations. In fact, they went on to actually mislead and make deceptive statements uh, to the newspaper in their response in which they made a statement that, and a, that the council adopted a proposal to deny zoning applications. In fact, that's totally false. Attorney Hughes never recommended that council adopt any sort of proposal to reject variances. If this association actually paid attention took their blinders off, maybe turned the hearing aids up, they would actually hear that Attorney Hughes simply made a recommendation to the council, didn't ask to put any legislation together, any sort of proposals. So if we're going to make an objection, I think we need to have our facts straight. And evidently, this association um, has a difficult time grasping fact. Council at no time ever made a proposal, any adoptions, you were simply asked to have Attorney Hughes come forward at any future zoning meeting and object to any variance. As we know, the university for decades now has quite frankly gone beyond their boundaries. And we have ourselves to blame for that because we allowed it to happen. Not the council, but elected officials in the past, redevelopment authorities and others who let it happen. And now they've become bullies. They've spewed a lot of arrogance and are trying to dictate what goes on in the city. And I'm sure if they really wanted to, knowing the millions they take, they take in, they could probably buy us if they wanted to. And that's really what frustrates me, is knowing the millions and millions they take in each year, knowing full well the fiscal situation we're in today that we face, and they come forward each year and give us a measly $175,000 a year. And I can't tell you how much that bothers me, that this is a multi-million dollar institution they're not a nonprofit, they're a business, they're a for-profit. And they've gotten away with a lot, and it's unacceptable. We saw, I believe it was yesterday's paper, 
the purchase of the Adlin building on the corner of Linden and Adams for $2 million. They, have, they could spend money like it's, it's, it's growing on trees. They have no problem doing it. And they continue to suck up properties left and right and continue to take these properties out the tax rolls. And we're consistently told by university officials, we're told by the mayor, that they're such an asset to the city and we should be so supportive. Well, my question is, what, what exactly have they done for the city? In all actuality, let's be realistic. What has the university done for the city? Besides take millions and millions of dollars of properties out the tax rolls. They're buying properties that are assessed at $30,000. They're buying them for a half a million. So they have no problem just sucking up properties left and right. I mean, at some point in time, that, that, that hill section is going to be the university. And it's my opinion at this point, maybe they should just fence themselves in and become their own little village up there and let them deal with their own problems. You know what? Let them get their own fire department. They already have a police department. Let them get a fire department. Let them get an ambulance service. And you know what? If they have an issue up there, we're not going to respond to it. Let them deal with it. Pay your fair share. Why should I or any other taxpayer who works hard every day carry their load? Let them pay for their own services. I think we need to be fed up. We should, a lot of the residents of the city should be fed up with it because they've gotten a free ride and we've sat back and done nothing about it. Now, one of the things I've done is I've looked into other nonprofits around the country and we've discussed uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Well, I took it a step further to do some research on them and I found it that they did a, um, a com they put a commission together in Rhode Island of elected officials, business leaders, and other concerned individuals and they discussed ways of how they can get nonprofits to contribute uh, to their fiscally um, mismanaged cities. And for several months they sat down and they put a team together and they came up with a commission report. And we could say, as we've said before, that now the universities in that town give up to $2 million a year. There's no reason why this university can't do the same thing. I also feel that due to the fact the university's gotten a free ride for so long and they claim to do so much for the city, well, perhaps at this point, we can look into discussions with the university on having all city residents that attend the university attend at a discounted rate. It's been brought up before. Maybe even taking it a step further and offering a full scholarship as an incentive to, to uh, city students. We're trying to build future leaders of the city, and why not reach out and make that a recommendation? I think it's the least they could do. They've gotten a free ride, and we've done nothing. But that's what I suggest we do. We look into all avenues. But to continue to allow them to bully us and just sit back and do nothing isn't right. And I know we have a council committed to reaching out to all nonprofits, not just the university, because we're, we're constantly criticized that we finger point at the university. But they're the best example we can use because they've taken so much from us and they've given little in return. And we need to put our foot down and stop it now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Les Spindler. Good evening, Council Lesbillers, to the resident homeowner taxpayer. Good evening. Uh, Doug mentioned already, I was really disturbed the other day to wake up, read the paper, and see the university bought the Adlin building. I guess they ran out of buildings in the hill section to buy. Now they're moving downtown. But what's going to be next? The Farley's building across the street? They're going to move down Mulberry Street here, maybe by City Hall? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. There's going to be Signs coming into the city instead of welcome to Scranton, it's going to be welcome to the University of Scranton. It, it's, when is this going to stop? It's, it's unbelievable. And uh, the mayor makes a comment. I'm a big supporter of the University of Scranton, Mr. Doherty said. All the investments they have made have benefited the city. They bought a tax-paying property on Mulberry and Jefferson, tore it down out to green space. How is that benefiting the city? You know what, this, this man, new election is next May, this man has got to go. He's raising everybody's taxes, lets the university buy everything, buys up all the tax-paying properties. This Adlin building, there's businesses in there, there's a, the, the attorney's offices. What, this building brings in, I don't know how much money every year. And they got it for two million. That that's a steal. And uh, I, uh, with all due respect to city council, I uh, don't agree with that idea that uh, 
to plan to fight all zoning variances because what if a new council's up there and they don't go along with that? I said a few weeks ago that uh, you should draw up an ordinance whereas if a nonprofit buys a tax paying property, they have to keep paying the taxes on that property. That way, whoever's sitting up there has to go by that ordinance. So, uh, I think that's a better idea, but that's just my opinion. Uh, two weeks ago, Councilman Laskin read a letter from Charlie Newcomb Jr. about his flooding, proper, flooding problem getting fixed. Well, uh, I've been coming here maybe even longer than Charlie complaining about my property getting flooded. And about two years ago, it was fixed, but I did come here and say that winter it was all washed away, it wasn't done properly, and I have come here time after time. I mean, Mr. Lasko was supposed to look into it, and I don't know what happened, but I uh, wish I could get that thing going, because every time it rains, my front of my eye can't go out my front door, and I can't walk in front of the house, it's just inches of water. And, uh, I think I did ask council a while back to send a letter to Mr. Doerr. I don't know if he did or not, but uh, maybe you could send another one, see if something could be done. He's not, pretty soon uh, the bad weather's gonna come in and that'll be their excuse that they can't do anything now. And this so. is, is this, uh, because I remember when we had this taken care of, this yeah. is a catch basin? No, there's no catch basin there. Okay. So curbing, curbing. They put the handicapped sidewalks in, the handicapped corners. I mean, the water comes right in off the street. Uh, okay. And they did fix it. They left the handicapped ramp there. Uh -huh. So it was still handicapped accessible, but the little curb they put in washed right away. And uh, Representative Murphy, had he looked into that. And it seemed like when he looked into it, that's when it got done. So uh, I'd appreciate any help from council again. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Gerard Hetman. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Gerard Hetman from the Lackawanna County Department of Community Relations. I would like to begin this evening by reminding Council, as well as members of the general public, that the Lackawanna County audit for 2011 has been completed, not just on time, but ahead of schedule this year which is a first for many years in the past where the audit has been behind its scheduled date. For residents and council members who may wish to access a PDF copy of the audit, they can visit our homepage at LackawannaCounty.org and scroll down about two thirds down the length of the page and under the news and events section, there's a link to an electronic PDF copy of the completed audit document for any council member or taxpayer who may wish to review the documents and the figures for themselves. Uh, second, at their last regular scheduled public meeting, the county commissioners announced the launch of the new Lackawanna County Carrier Grade Wireless Network. This is an initiative that has been high in the commissioner's list of objectives, and they're very excited about the launch of this service. Uh, there will be further announcements as the wireless network is launched, uh, how it can benefit businesses, emergency service providers, and also municipal governments in Lackawanna County. Uh, we have a list of the ways, the four stages, that the service will be implemented in. But it will be implemented using existing infrastructure, um, and county communication towers, and the Lackawanna County 911 Center. It's being done in a budget neutral fashion, which will eliminate payments for services currently offered through the, uh, currently provided through those networks, and it will also utilize grants and other means of financing so that there will not be an increase to the county budget. And again, we will deliver more details on this as the service is implemented and made available to the various constituents in Lackawanna County, and we'll be happy to take any questions on that. We will relay them to our IT department and provide answers to anyone who may wish to know more about the service as it continues to develop over the course of this year and next year. Uh, third, relating to some of the community events and announcements that we talk about and that you pass along to the general public, the Lackawanna County Department of Community Relations, in conjunction with the Lackawanna County IT Department, has launched a community calendar section on the Lackawanna County homepage at LackawannaCounty.org. Again, if you scroll down on the right of the homepage as it's aligned, aligned now, you'll see a community calendar icon. If you click on that, we have this calendar is broken down according to different parts of the county, Triborough, Upper Valley, and we have one for Scranton and Dunmore in the same calendar. 
So any announcements, such as the items you mentioned, Mrs. Evans, this evening, I know you'll continue to mention them, and uh, we'll be happy to put those onto the community calendar section under the appropriate area of where they're located in the county. And of course, I'll take notes on those at these meetings. And if you have any of them in particular that you'd like to let us know about before the meetings, or that you'd like to provide some additional details on, please, please feel free to contact me or speak to me before or after the meeting. And we'll make sure that those items are added. And we can put them on for wherever they may be around the county. And we get all these things that you talk about, whether they're picnics, uh, benefits for residents that may be in need of some assistance due to a medical condition or an unfortunate circumstance, a neighborhood block party, anything of that nature, we'll be happy to put it on there, and members of the public can access it and learn more about it as it comes up. Thank you. And then two announcements this evening. Uh, the Scranton Booksbury Yankees are offering the, part, the chance to be a part of history in the renovation and reconstruction of PNC Field. Fans are offered the opportunity to sign the final steel beam, uh, steel I-beam or channel, that will be installed at the newly renovated PNC Field. Uh, the event is taking place this coming Tuesday, October 9th, from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. at PNC Field in Music. Uh, it'll take place at the open space in the parking lot near the trolley restoration shop. That's right down on the third base line on the field, and residents can enter uh, via the previous media gate, which is the first turn off of Montage Mountain Road. So they'll actually have the Sharpies there, but you can come and leave your autograph on the steel beam uh, for the duration of the stadium's existence in the future. So many, many years, many good seasons, hopefully everyone's invited to come and, and sign the, uh, the item in question. And then last but not least, uh, the Lackawanna County branch of Penn State Extension is offering their master gardener training for any county residents who may be interested in learning more um, about horticulture and gardening and who have an active interest in gardening. The training starts uh, Monday and Thursday nights beginning October 22nd uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. Information is available by calling 570-963-6842 or email lackawannamg at psu.edu. Again, the phone number is 570-963-6842. Six eight four two, and I don't have a green thumb, despite my mother's best efforts over the years. But I know the Master Gardener program is something that many of our local residents take a great interest in, and those people do a great deal of work with the training that's provided through that program in beautifying our communities, neighborhood gardens, and individual properties as well. And uh, last but not least, we wish everyone the best who's participating and observing the Steam Town Marathon. I don't know, Mr. McGough, will we see you out there this year? Uh, not this year. Uh, we're going to see it. <laughs> Ever since the second year, it's come right by my house, and we enjoy it throughout the county. It connects all of our, many of our communities, brings out the best in our local residents, and also visitors from other areas around the area and around the world. So thank you, and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Um, tonight, I'd just like to make a couple of comments, if I could. Um, you know, everybody has their opinions on nonprofits. And um, with that said, I'd just like to say that a lot of nonprofits have had money willed to them in trusts from people who've passed away. And um, a lot of times, they're the only people with any money left because uh, the taxing bodies have decimated their own tax bases to the point where nonprofits were the only ones that were sheltered. And um, I don't disagree that some nonprofits should pay, but I think our country has reached a point where it's so financially strapped for money that whoever has the money, they're coming for it. And wealthy people, if you read the paper, they're renouncing their citizenship and they're taking their money out of the country or they're putting it in trust for their children outside the ability of the country to reach it. And former President Clinton talked about that about two years ago and asked people to bring some of their money back home because it was outside the reach of the, of the U.S. government. But tonight, I've done two right to knows <clears throat> and I think they're important. I've asked um, a right to know on how many investigations has City Council done under Section 312 of the Home Rule Charter for any reason? All right, and I asked if any subpoenas were ever issued, not just by this council, but by any council. And I've also done a request 
under um, section 313. And I have asked how many and when were any special audits done or frequent audits done by city council under section 313 of the Home Rule Charter. Because I think that we're talking about commuter taxes and sales tax increases and um, this city has been in trouble since the early 70s. And I just think that after all these decades, something should have been done a long time ago. And you know, when you, when you talk to as many people as, as I have talked to in this city who have reverse mortgage their homes to pay more taxes, um, they just, they question the whole process. And I, I really have to say that throwing money at the city isn't the answer because I, how does a city assume this much debt? And, you know, we're all going to throw shots at Mr. Doherty. And, you know, well, look, politics is politics. But the privatization of the Scranton Sewer Authority didn't take place under his watch. And the city wasn't sanctioned under his watch. Okay, that was a previous administration. And, you know, when you, when you really start taking a look at where the city is, it's like a freight train without, without an engineer. Because I'm, someone should have stepped in and found out where all the city's money was going long ago. Now, there's been a lot of special interest here. You know, people talk about people outside the city giving money in campaigns, and that does happen because they have a vested interest. And for a long time, the city's workforce were used as tools, in my opinion, by political people to get elected. And, you know, things were going fairly well because everybody was getting what they wanted except the people who lived in the city. And when you look at the amount of taxation coming, I think it's really time to ask the Commonwealth how when we entered into a recovery plan that nobody made sure we were recovering. And now, you know, when you sit there and you watch TV and you watch everybody talk about what they're going to do for us and about, well, come get your reverse mortgage and stay in your house. My question is, when all the residents of this city went to work every day and sacrificed throughout their working life to pay their mortgage and meet their obligations, and now they're seniors, some of them are lucky, they get into the high rises, some of them can't escape from their property and they can't sell it because people won't come here. And I think that we've limited the scope of our discussion here to nonprofits. And I really, what I think we need to do is we need to take a good hard look at city government over an extended period of time, find out where the mistakes were made and who made them. And I find it very interesting, you know, to read the Scranton Times newspaper and we talk about who our next field of candidates are. You know, I'd like to see a little old man or a little old lady living on a fixed income in this city run for a public office. Well, and maybe it would you be, Mr. McGough, but, uh, you know, I remember going to a school board meeting over 25 years ago when there was a lady with uh, her stockings rolled over her tennis shoes saying she couldn't pay anymore, and she was crying there. And I just think that maybe we need to really investigate our own government and find out where we fell short. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Elizabeth Davis. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Davis, and I'm here on behalf of Scranton Reads. Scranton Reads is a community reading organization, or excuse me, reading event, uh, organized by the City of Scranton and the Albert Memorial Library. Each year, during the month of October, citizens of Scranton get together to read a great work of literature. They participate in book discussions and special events related to the chosen work. Scranton Reads has two main goals. The first goal is to encourage reading among people of all ages, and the second goal is to bring the community together through a sharing of common experiences. 
Scranton reads one city, one book, enhances the feeling of community by bringing people from all different backgrounds and uniting them through the love of literacy, art, and culture. And this year, we've selected Rudolfo Anaya's Bless Me Ultima. It's a coming of age story of a young boy in New Mexico of uh, Mexican heritage and his um, you know, realization of what he be is to become when he becomes older. We hope everyone can join in to help celebrate our 11th year by participating in this year's activities. You can find more information about um, our book discussions and different events at our website at scrantonreads.org. And this year we're going to culminate um, all of the activities in an immigration panel discussion at the Everhart on October 24th at 7 p.m. And if I may, I have copies for everyone on council. Oh, please. Oh, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Good evening, council. Dave Dobson, resident of Scranton. Good evening. Um, last meeting, and I understand Mr. Williams passed away, but there was a mention of, uh, and he was very, probably very sick before he did. Uh, there's a mention of attendance, and with the tasks we have confronting us with the uh, zoning, uh, hopefully we can find somebody that will stand their ground, and I felt that uh, Attorney Hughes' idea was a pretty good one. I think at this time, just like Mr. Spindler, that it's time to just say, we have enough nonprofits in the area. And that's the way it is. We can't support anymore. And we can't keep uh, surrendering these uh, taxable buildings over to nonprofits. Irregardless of what the merit of their work is, some is better than others. And I'll speak a little bit more on that. Uh, but. Uh, now, we have, uh, in the times, of course, council gets abused and bullied constantly here. Stop abusing assets. And of course, this person here is from Dixon City, and he's ashamed of the comments at council. And council should give the university any blighted properties on Mulberry Street Carter and in the entire historic hill section. But now wait a minute, he's from Dixon City. And I would like to know what the tax rates are for standard working class housing in Dixon City and uh, uh, Archibald and uh, especially Mayfield where the mayor is uh, rabbling about uh, our concerns and uh, our uh, uh, commuter tax. It, it would be just lovely. I would doubt that it's over $500 a year like uh, everybody stating up in Clark Summit and maybe at Fawnwood or somewhere like that where it's reasonably new housing and they kind of fell through the cracks uh, with uh, the prices. And uh, on zoning, I'd love to see someday uh, Mr. Morgan has a huge house there, and as far as I know, two people live in it because somebody from the zoning forbade him from renting it out, although it was an extended family type thing where there was three. And a lot of times, maybe that's his source of hostility, too. Uh, so I'd love to see where eventually when we have one old person living in a four bedroom house where we could expand that and maybe let them uh, uh, open up a small rental uh, $750 a month for uh, uh, one room apartment isn't 
uh, what these developers and so forth. That's pouring money into their pocket. And, uh, I'd also like to remind the Pennsylvania Association of Nonprofit Organizations. They mentioned that today that they're supposed to be nonpartisan. Well, I would suggest they stay there because if you follow national politics, many of these uh, church organizations and so forth are up to their eyeballs in politics. They want to tell you how to plan your family. They want to tell you what you should drink. They want to tell you what you should watch on television even. They want to tell you what kind of books to read. And they, they know everything there is about love and God and war politically, but then they want nonprofit uh, status. And that is not a nonprofit. I am a strict secularist as far as government is concerned. If you oppose the death penalty where somebody kills their wife or their husband or something like that in a, in a, a furious situation, that's one thing. But uh, don't stand there and tell me how many kids I have to have or whether or not I can have a drink or uh, we had the uh, Prohibition years back where the Mafia finally got routed from New York City in 1995, from 1920s. They took over the organized crime and they, uh, you know, they never got them out of there. And uh, there are criminal organizations and so forth. So this is the Achilles heel of the, the uh, nonprofits is I expect secular performance and non-discrimination, and I'm not interested in the fact that their religion doesn't believe in a blood transfusion, so therefore my boss should be able to refuse me a blood transfusion because he doesn't believe in that. Uh, Golden Parrot, quick. If anybody watched the uh, debates last night, they go to the Obama advisors, <laughs> as I mean. It's, it was really shameful how much he let Governor Romney get away with, or get away with saying, and just, they, they didn't want him to look like an angry black man. And uh, the uh, strategic, strategic allied consultants, uh, they have been uh, signing people up, hired by uh, a certain party. I won't get into that. Uh, in various states uh, to sign people up to vote, they were actually shredding some, which is blatantly illegal. And our Scranton School Board, when are you going to get it through your heads that we need peaked roofs in this area? Please, peak roofs on all the schools. Scranton, uh, South Scranton Intermediate looks like a swimming pool from my porch whenever it rains. That water lays there. And we have no peaks on the roofs, and every new school they design is a flat roof. I think somebody, whoever is designing those schools, must have a flat head. Thank you, and have a good night. Bok, bok. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Yes, I do. Good evening, council. Marie Schumacher, citizen and taxpayer. Good evening. Um, I'm still working off my question list. I, I did have something else tonight, but I inadvertently left it on the kitchen table, so uh, next week. Uh, the proposals for the 60-day trial period for a different parking meter system were received six weeks ago. When will the winner's trial commence? Um, I am not sure of the exact date, but I will get that information for you. Okay. Uh, and before I go any further, I would also like, although it wasn't noted by, um, uh, by the chair tonight, um, Bill Hinkleman, who I think for something like 30 years was president of the, uh, the board of the Albright Memorial Library, and, um, um, and he's been very active civically, and I think his passing will certainly be missed by the, the community and, and many of uh, the many charities and uh, cultural things that he and his wife support it. So, um, and then on 7A, uh, I believe uh, when uh, Mr. Boris was talking.
talking about the private road and taking over this property. He was talking of Lake Scranton um, estates. Lake Scranton estates that that retention pond has been taken over years ago and the, the road was made private years ago. And personally, I do believe that they should have to pay for their own, if they want a private road, they should have to pay for their own snow removal too, but they, um, that's not what's at issue here tonight. This is a, a separate development that is right across, well, it's between the uh, Bird Street end of Mountain Lake and the um, Robinson Park up on the hill. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, as things stand right now, the city doesn't even own that, that road. So once this is passed tonight, and I certainly encourage it, uh, that the road will belong to the city, otherwise there, there's a gap in it and it will allow a better usage of the, of the lake and, uh, and development. There was a Times Tribune article on September 23rd that described a computer software program uh, that provides emergency responders with a visual floor plan of a building even before they arrive at the scene. Uh, does our public safety department have this capability? I am not sure if they have this capability at the present time, but I will relate that to our public safety chair. Okay, when, do we have any idea when Mr. Lawson is going to return? I have a couple of other public safety things, but I've been holding, but. I haven't spoke to him, but it would be my intention that he would return as soon as he is doing well. Okay. Um, the audit. When are we going to see this audit that we were going to have the, the meeting on in the early June? Yes, originally, uh, according to the business administrator's reports, it was supposed to be done in early June. All the information was supposed to be gathered. There is some information that is still outstanding. In fact, um, Rossi and Rossi just sent us correspondence uh, regarding that. So I will contact our business administrator and see if he could get a concrete date on the new correspondence that we just received today. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we, where do we stand? We're borrowing all this money. Where do we stand on the Unit Debt Act? How close are we to our ceiling? At this point, I, I'm not sure of the exact figure is how, fa how far away from the ceiling we are, but I could get that information for you. Uh, yeah, I would like that because I don't know what happens when we hit the ceiling. Do we just go into bankruptcy then? Or, I mean, what, what option do we have once we've reached our ceiling? And it, I, I think that, that audit, it, that's, it's just, I mean, I know people have been busy on other things, but this is not the first year, but I hope it's certainly the last. How many years are left in Rossi and Rossi's uh, contract? Two minutes. One? <laughs> I believe they still have um, two more years left. left in their contract. Two, oh. That's too bad. And then I would also like to add, I, first of all, I wish, I wish Mr. Burke was it, the first speaker tonight. I wish him luck with signs because there are signs on Seymour Avenue saying truck traffic for delivery on, uh, only, and it doesn't stop any of those same trucks from coming down Seymour Avenue. Uh, East Mountain Road was redone, what, maybe five years ago, and it's rapidly breaking up. This week there was yet another 53-foot uh, tractor trailer came up East Mountain Road. It's, it's crazy. Uh, and there is no marking at the base of East Mountain Road, but I'm assuming that that applies, that the uh, truck traffic is prohibited for, except for deliveries, applies to the entire mountain because otherwise if you come in Seymour Avenue, you sort of have no place else to go. Um, 
Um, but maybe you could find that out. And if they have any luck, I, I would love to know what it is because the truck traffic is crazy. I mean, we have big, heavy trucks ruining what was our new road. So, um, uh, so I say I wish them luck. And I will give one more. I, I just have to do this one since everybody else spoke over tonight. The Community Medical Center, um, our wonderful regional it's regional when it comes to um, when it comes to spending the money they receive, but it's um, it's not so much when the taxes have to be that they're not paying have to be borne by Scranton taxpayers. You may have noticed this ad in the paper that shows that their gala fundraiser is being held down at the Woodlands in Wilkesboro. I certainly would think one of our local hotels and conference centers would have been uh, far more appropriate and they could do something to support our city. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, stop, Pat. Hey, Chrissy. Hi, hey, Janet. Hey, Chris. Well, Janet, tomorrow's a big one tomorrow. What do you think? What's well, other way? Or what? what do you think tomorrow? What West do you think? Think you win the way of Frankie? Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a close hey, game. Tip it to the hospital. Tip it to the hospital. Oh. Yes, get it, get it. Let's just pray for him today. Everybody say pray for Tip. All of us. I'm, yes. I'm serious. All right? Thanks. Yes, I appreciate I it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Fifth order, 5A motions. Councilman Goff, do you have any comments or questions? <laughs> comments or motions? And questions. <laughs> Actually, I'd start with a question. Um, I, I know we brought up uh, the replacement on the zoning board. I, I was, my question was, does one of the alternates move into that position and then we fill the alternate spot? Or is it a, a new, you know, do, do we appoint someone to fulfill the the term of Mr. Williams? I think it's a matter of appointing someone new. I don't know that the alternates have moved into a permanent position unless okay. one of the council members wanted to make a an alternate. I said, uh, okay, I, I was just wondering how, what the, and when, um, I don't know what the process is. I believe is. it was Frank appointed Mr. Bartnicki as an alternate and then the second time around when a spot came open he appointed mm -hmm. him as the full time but this one it seems to me would be the remainder of the term mm -hmm. okay <laughs> <laughs> it was just a matter of procedure I just wasn't sure how we went about it and, and the only other thing I, I did want to comment on all of the the things going on about the University of Scranton and the, the comments being made um, I, I guess perhaps I have a little bit different perspective uh, with the University of Scranton. I, I do see it as a very positive thing for the city of Scranton. Um, I, I know that we could argue about the economic impact that it has had on the city, um, pointing to you know, properties taken off the tax rolls, taxes that they do pay, don't pay. Um, real estate transfer taxes that are paid on the properties, permits and fees, all of those things are, I, I guess, a matter of perspective, uh, you know, how you look at it and how you value um, what's being done. Um, I see them as the, you know, they are, I believe, if they're not the largest non-governmental employer in the city, I think they're the second largest. Um, and, and I believe that that's an important thing. They are, yes, they are a successful business. They employ a large number of people. And I think that's of great benefit to the city. But I think that the, the biggest thing that's, that the University of Scranton has done for the city it is a neighborhood improvement. And I know somebody, one of the speakers said, you know, what have they done? Um, I remember what that Mulberry Street corridor looked like from Scott's Market up to Turkey Hill 25 years ago. Yeah, it, was, it was prostitution, drugs, crime of all sorts. 
At one point in time, the, the city even put a substate, a police substation there because there was such an incidence of crime. Over the past 25 years, that has been um, cleaned up sidewalks, lights, new buildings. Um, it, it's now a, a corridor into the city and out of the city. So I, I think that that's an important aspect of what the University of Scranton does for the community. I think they have helped, I think they have bettered the community. But, and, and that's not for argument's sake. I, I'm not looking to create an argument. I, I, I just, I, like I said, I think I have a different, maybe a different perspective um, than some people. As far as the, they're challenging the parking tax, um, I, I think that's something that we should have expected. And in fact, um, when I saw that they were doing it, it was almost like, thank you. I, I, I think we should welcome the opportunity to, to see what the courts are going to say about our ability to set fees for tax-exempt institutions. Uh, I, I think that by taking something like this to the court, uh, we start to define some of the parameters um, for, I'll say, taxing these institutions. And um, as we, I, I think throughout the state this has been happening. And I think perhaps it, it just brings it, it brings the issue to the forefront and at least allows us to see where we can go and where we can't go. Um, as far as the, the purchase of the, is it the Adlin building? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, one of the things I'd like to find out, and, and we've talked about this on numerous occasions, is what portion of that building, now that it's been pur purchased, will be used for educational purposes? If it's not being used for educational purposes, if they're renting out space to lawyers or accountants or you know whatever else is in there now, then I believe that that should be you know taxable property. That not all of that building necessarily goes off the tax rolls. Uh, and I and again we've talked about this on numerous occasions. I, I, I think we really need to do a little bit more work on trying to determine exactly what is taxable within these tax-exempt institutions. Is, is the cafeteria taxable? Since they do provide food for non-students and non-workers. You and I can, you know, anybody can walk in there and buy lunch. Actually, it's a great lunch uh, for the price, uh, if anyone's interested, I guess. Um, but does Aramark, who provides the food service, do they pay taxes on that? Um, does the Starbucks pay taxes? And, and again, uh, this isn't anything new, but I think that these are the things that we really have to investigate and, and determine exactly what is, you know, taxable within these, these places and what is not. And the last thing, uh, obviously, the, the payments in lieu of taxes. Um, we attacked the University of Scranton over it. Uh, and, and perhaps maybe we should negotiate with them for what many people see as a more equitable amount in payments of lieu of taxes. But the fact still remains that they're one of the few institutions to pay anything in lieu of taxes. Um, I think that we should start moving towards some of these other tax-exempt institutions and um, maybe a little more aggressive negotiation with them and um, as well as the University of Scranton. Um, we're going to, part of the recovery plan is a, is a reliance on an increase in pilots. And um, I guess I, I'm not sure that going to war with them is the way to get that increase done. And um, 
I'm hoping that perhaps we can reach a more equitable settlement in a more um, equitable way. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Rogan? Yes, thank you. I'll be very brief tonight. Um, I would first like to apologize in advance. Um, next week I will not be able to attend the meeting. I am undergoing a medical procedure. I should only be out one week, hopefully as long as everything goes well. Um, and just some comments. Um, received a letter and, and I spoke to various members of the zoning board um, following some of the comments that were made by residents and by Mr. McGough. And I'd like to read the, the letter that I received and, and speak about it a little bit. It says, um, and this is from Carrie Newcomb, a member of the zoning board. It says, Dear Honorable City Council, I'm writing you this letter in regards to comments made by Mr. McGough at a previous council meeting and in the Scranton Times on, on September 25th, 2012. Uh, and this is the quote from uh, Mr. McGough in the newspaper. It said, uh, Very often some of these votes are being made based simp simply on the influence of the outside, being the neighbors or other businesses in opposition to what the zoning codes are, Mr. McGough said, rather than making that difficult decision and saying to neighbors, what being proposed is within the law or codes and therefore we're going to approve it. They're really voting in opposition to what is legal and what should be done. I think that perhaps we should really take a look at the nature of the zoning board, Mr. McGough said. Ms. Newcomb, Mrs. Newcomb goes on to say, I was appointed to the zoning board in July of 2011 I take offense to some of Mr. McGough's statements. I speak for myself when I say that I take great pride in my position and consider it to be an honor to serve my community and its residents. Since I've been on the board, we have, an, we have had a number of applicants that have been denied and the issues were never headlines or resulted in sub, such obnoxious and inaccurate statements by a councilman. I personally have no influence of outside being neighbors or other business and take great offense to that statement. I assure you, I take all the testimony and hearing into consideration and visit each property prior to my vote. I say that I am voting against what is legal and should be done is inexcusable. I assure you, it, I, assure you I will continue to vote the same way regardless of, co of comments by any council member. There is an appeal process if an applicant is denied and Mr. Lewis or any other applicant that is denied has a right to follow that process. Sincerely, Carrie Newcomb. And I, I did speak to many, many zoning board members that were upset with what transpired, not only by what Mr. McGough said, but what some of the speakers have said at, at meetings and, and what's been going on at the zoning board. And a lot of people, you know, zoning, luckily it's broadcast live for everyone to see, and zoning members are appointed by city council. But after that appointment is made, City Council doesn't have any influence over the decisions that are made. Um, I think most of us, when we appoint somebody to the zoning board, you think of somebody that shares your values and your beliefs, and you appoint them, and then once they're appointed, they're basically, you know, they're, they're, they're their own body. It's almost, I would almost say like a judge. If you watch a meeting, you see people get, will get sworn in, They'll testify, the neighbors will testify, the applicant say they're seeking a variance in a neighborhood. And then it's up to the body to basically decide what is legal. And oftentimes, and I know for a fact, as I'm an avid watcher of many municipal government meetings, that oftentimes the board does go against the neighbors. Oftentimes they go in favor of, of the neighbors. And even as a council member, there are times when people I've appointed to the board have voted a way that I disagreed with. But that's not how the system is set up. It's set up to appoint, you appoint somebody with like ideas, and then they go based on their judgments of the law. So I, I just wanted to read that because we did receive it. And finally, I do have one request. Um, I believe we all received this letter. Um, from a resident of the city who owns numerous properties and he's concerned about the zone nightclub and I haven't heard of this new name I I know it's, it's at the location where the castle restaurant used to be in North Scranton and that has been a problem for years um, stabbings shootings there are a lot of problems there um, so mrs. Craig can we please I, I'll give you the letter can we please send this to the chief of police and maybe forward it to the Liquor Control Board as well. 
I think they might be interested to know what's going on there. I know it is an after hours club and there are different rules and regulations for after hours versus a traditional bar. But this has been an ongoing issue for at least five years, probably even longer. And that is all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Joyce, do you have any comments or motions? Yes, uh, I'll be brief tonight as well. To begin tonight, I'm going to address the Scranton Single Tax Office. The city has received a number of checks from the Scranton Single Tax Office. As one knows, the Scranton Single Tax Office collects current real estate tax, delinquent real estate tax for 2011, the local service tax, as well as the business privilege and mercantile taxes. The Scranton Single Tax Office also collects earned income tax from 2011, which at this point is primarily proceeds from the fourth quarter of 2011. The checks that the city has received from the Scranton Single Tax Office are as follows. A check for $241,269.07, which consists of $235,683.48 in current real estate tax collections and $5,585.59 in delinquent real estate tax collections. A check for $27,784.62, which consists of collections from the earned income tax proceeds from the fourth quarter of 2011 that still weren't collected. A check for $163,338.53, which consists of $120,203.78 in local service tax revenue and $43,134.75 in business privilege and mercantile tax revenue. The summation of these checks is $432,392.22. We've also received correspondence from tax collector Bill Courtright regarding the Scranton Single Tax Office's collections and distributions for the period ending on September 18th of 2012. First, in regard to real estate tax collection so far for this year, the tax office has collected and distributed $11,852,412.28 in current real estate taxes. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $10,965,343.96. With this in mind, there's been an overall increase in real estate tax collections of $887,068.32. This um, is an increase of approximately 8.1% from the same period last year. Secondly, in regard to delinquent real estate tax collections, for this year so far, the tax office has collected $476,031.45. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $550,938.74. With this in mind, there's been an overall decrease in delinquent real estate tax collections of $74,907.29 thus far. This is a decrease in collections of approximately 13.6% from the same period last year. <clears throat> Third, in regard to the local service tax, for this year so far, the tax office has collected $1,143,385.82. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $1,000,000 $299,619.34. With this in mind, there has been an overall decrease in local service tax collections of $156,233.52 thus far. This is a decrease in collections of, of approximately 12% from the same period last year. Fourth, in regard to the business privilege and mercantile taxes, for this year so far, the tax office has collected $1,746,933.69. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $1,381,051.54. With this in mind, there's been an overall increase of $365,882.15 in business privilege and mercantile tax collections thus far. This is an increase in 
tax collection of approximately 26.5% from the same period last year. Also to report, the Scranton Single Tax Office has collected $6,134,771.71 this year in earned income taxes. As far as offering a comparison to the amount collected last year, it wouldn't be comparing apples to apples since Berkheimer took over the collection of 2012 earned income taxes. The $6,134,771 collected by the Scranton Single Tax Office is primarily fourth quarter earned income tax receipts from 2011 that were paid this year as I stated previously. With that in mind, Mrs. Craig, if we could please um, send a request to Berkheimer to find out how much uh, earned income tax revenue was distributed to the city by them this year. Overall, the Scranton Single Tax Office in regard to the real estate tax, delinquent real estate tax from 2011, local service tax and, and business privilege and mercantile taxes um, collections the Scranton Single Tax Office has collected a total of $15,218,763.24. In the same period last year for these taxes, the Scranton Single Tax Office had collected $14,196,953.58 for these taxes. This is an, an approximate increase in overall tax collections of 7.64%. So uh, I'd like to thank the tax office for their uh, good work over there. While we're on the subject of revenue, the, Scranton, er, the city of Scranton has received a check from the state of Pennsylvania in the amount of $2,921,681.70 $2, in general municipal pension system state aid proceeds. The budgeted amount for this revenue item was $2.71 million. The amount of money that the city received was calculated and issued in accordance with the Municipal Pension Plan Funding and Recovery Act, which is Act 205 of 1984. State law prohibits these funds for any other purpose than to defray Scranton's police, fire, and non-uniform pension costs. Act 205 required that this check is deposited in pension plans by the treasurer of Scranton within 30 days of receipt. The allocation of state aid that we received had been computed using data from actuarial studies that were submitted by the city to the Public Employees Retirement Commission and from the pen pension certification form that was submitted to the state of Pennsylvania. To continue on the subject of revenue, the city has received a payment in lieu of taxes known as a pilot the city has received a check in the amount of six million dollars from Lutherwood. To provide a brief background, oh, six thousand dollars, sorry. We wish it was six million dollars. Um, to provide a brief background, Lutherwood is a senior uh, living facility located in the East Mountain area in close proximity to Lake Scranton. With this in mind, I'd like to express my appreciation to Luther Wood for being a good neighbor and contributing their fair share. In addition to some of the revenue items that I previously discussed, I'm going to trans, uh, transition to an expenditure that Scranton City Council has been notified of that really hasn't been brought up much at council meetings or this year. As one may or may not know, the city of Scranton Scranton is required to pay $50 for every stray animal that our animal control officer brings to the Griffin Pond Animal Shelter. Um, Scranton City Council has received receipts for animals brought to the shelter for July and August. For the month of July, 43 animals were brought to the shelter. Uh, this resulted in a cost of $2,150. For the month of August, 39 animals were brought to the shelter. This resulted in a cost of $1,950. So far this year, to provide an update to everyone, the total uh, number of animals brought to the Griffin Pond Animal Shelter is 314. This has resulted in a cost of $15,700 to the city of Scranton. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Good evening. I have only a few items of business to address. First, 
City Council had requested a weekly report identifying police vehicles that have been serviced or awaiting repair. The reason for such and the expected date of completion from Mr. Dewar, DPW Director, on September 7th. To date, no reports have been submitted. Mrs. Craig, please contact Mr. Dewar regarding the reports and send a second correspondence as a follow-up and record, please. Because there have been numerous vehicles out of service for a prolonged period, City Council wants to remain on top of this issue. Second, we received a response on September 24th 2012 from Mr. Jeff Fewer, Assistant District Traffic Manager for PennDOT, regarding the issue with traffic lights at the intersection of Spruce Street and Franklin Avenue. He states that he would like to get better flashers on stop signs or new batteries for them. Pull the stop signs off the sidewalk and put them in the parking lane for better visibility and put an additional stop sign on each of the remaining three mast arms. Also, he suggests that if the signals can be put in a red flash on the approaches that still have them, it would be a benefit to drivers. I hope PennDOT is examining and addressing these traffic hazards throughout the downtown as the traffic light replacement program continues. Third, uh, on behalf of Scranton City Council, I wish to thank Luther Wood Senior Living for its payment in lieu of taxes in the amount of $6,000 to the City of Scranton. We hope that more Scranton nonprofits will follow Luther Wood's example and provide a fair share contribution to their host city in light of its serious financial problems. On a related note, We've all read this week of the most recent purchase of a taxable property by the University of Scranton, owner of the greatest number of tax-exempt properties in our city. While page one of the October 3rd, 2012 edition of the newspaper included the headline, City Police Overtime, $313,000 over budget already, page two's headline read, University buys Adlin Building, Courthouse Square property purchased for $1.95 million. How coincidental that the city sinks farther into debt while a large nonprofit pays nearly $2 million for a building in the downtown commercial district that, according to the newspaper article, was unnatural to look at since it is adjacent to their campus. According to the university's vice president for external affairs, the university has needed extra space for a few years now. Yet he also states that long-term plans for the building have not been determined. Adding, we don't have a firm plan for every square foot of this building. While a nonprofit refuses to pay a parking tax for its garages and parking lots, for which it charges fees. It appears to have $2 million in available funds to purchase a property for which it has not fully determined a use. Further, it is interesting that the mayor, who has committed to obtain increased payments in lieu of taxes in a revised recovery plan, views the property purchase as a positive development for our struggling city. Although many Scrantonians, myself included, appreciate the beauty of the campus and high quality of education offered by the university, they cannot help but notice the university's apparent intent on expanding well beyond its institutional district into not only the hill section of Scranton, but also the commercial downtown area. They admire the institution but fear the financial burden frequent expansion creates. At the same time, however, Scranton's largest tax-exempt entities appear to have questionable regard for the poor people of Scranton who pay taxes for not only their own properties and public services, but also those of Scranton nonprofits who refuse to make 
fair share contributions for the properties they remove from the tax rolls and 24-7 services they receive from our city. Many taxpayers who are elderly, unemployed, or working two and three jobs to make ends meet feel the status quo is inequitable and want nonprofits to contribute their fair share. Finally, I have citizens' requests for the week. A letter to the sewer authority, Scranton residents request the cleaning of catch basins at the intersection of Prescott Avenue and Mulberry Street, on Harrison Avenue between Vine Street and Linden Street, and two on Yazoo Lane in East Mountain. A letter to licensing inspections and permits, a dilapidated property at 42017 17th Avenue was condemned three years ago and has remained vacant for many years. Although numerous calls were made to city inspectors by neighbors, nothing has been done. These neighbors have invested in restoring their property and feel they shouldn't have to live next to an eyesore. They question what they pay taxes for when garbage collections are missed and a condemned property was never further addressed by the city. Provide an update to City Council from Mr. Seitzinger on or before October 15, 2012. And a letter to the city engineer uh, regarding a street light at Lafayette Street and Boylan Lane. Council received a street light petition which has been properly completed by city residents and uh, we would like to attach this to the letter, forward it to the city engineer and please request uh, that his recommendation would be returned to city council uh, as soon as it's available. And that's it. 5B, no business at this time. Sixth order, 6A, reading by title, file of council number 61, 2012 in ordinance Amending file of council number 53, 2011, entitled an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the consolidated submission for community planning and development programs to be funded under the community development block grant program, home investment partnership program, and emergency solutions grants program. The purpose of this amendment is to allocate unobligated funds in the amount of $281,782.99 to the activity known as the Scranton 108 Loan Repayment for the Hotel and Conference Center under Promissory Note B-99-MC-42-0014. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. I make a motion to suspend the rules and move item 6A to seventh order for final passage pending input by the audience. Second. Uh, we have a motion on the floor and a second on the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Seventh order, 7A, seven for consideration by the Committee on Rules for adoption, file of council number 59, 2012, providing for the acceptance of certain streets, open space parcels, and stormwater facilities in the Mountain Lake Estate subdivision located in the city of Scranton, Pennsylvania also authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to accept for the sum of one dollar and record in the Lackawanna County Recorder of Deeds official records a deed for the above mentioned lands and right of ways. As chair for the committee on rules I recommend final passage of item 7a. Second. On the question. Um, Mrs. Craig I don't know if you would know anything about this or, or how we could find out um, it was mentioned tonight that, and I wasn't aware of this, uh, this street that's being ordained and taken over by the city um, is a no parking area? No. No? No, I, 
um, Ms. Schumacher uh, did mention, it, it's the area that Mr. Balls was talking about is for Lake Scranton estates, not Mountain Lake estates. Oh, good. Okay. It's, that, it's, that, a different, it's a different uh, development. That clears it up then. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else on the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. 7B for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, file of council number 60, 2012, creating and establishing a general fund account 01101860 titled First Liberty Bank escrow account City of Scranton earned income tax sinking fund for the receipt and disbursement of 2012 earned income tax revenue to be drawn down by Amalgamated Bank on a monthly basis for payment on the TAN Series B 2012. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Finance? As Chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of item 7B. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. 7C, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, resolution number 43, 2012, amending resolution number 674, 2000, as amended, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to execute and enter into promissory notes B-99-MC-42-0014 series and all other necessary loan documents in the amount of $3 million with the registered holder after watching company as security for an advance of monies from the United States Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development for the Hotel and Conference Center project. The purpose of this amendment is to authorize a defeasance of the City of Scranton's remaining obligation under a portion of promissory note B99MC420014, authorizing the establishment of a defeasance account with the Bank of New York Mellon as trustee and further authorizing the funding of the defeasance account with funds from the City of Scranton CDBG action plans of 2011 and 2012 and further authorizing the mayor and appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to execute all documentation necessary to accomplish the defeasance of a portion of the principal due under the above reference note. What is the recommendation of the chair for the Committee on Community Development? As chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7C. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7C legally and lawfully adopted. Is there anyone who wishes to address council on item 7D, formerly 6A, concerning the 108 loan repayment for the hotel and conference center? Mrs. Craig? 7D, previously 6A, after for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, file of council number 61, 2012, amending file of council number 53, 2011, entitled, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the consolidated submission for community planning and development programs to be funded under the Community Development Block Grant Program, Home Investment Partnership Program, and Emergency Solutions Grants Program. The purpose of this amendment is to allocate unobligated funds in the amount of $281,782.99 to the activity known as the Scranton 108 Loan Repayment for the Hotel and Conference Center under promissory note B99MC420014. <coughs> What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Community Development? As Chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7D. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. 
I hereby declare item 7D legally and lawfully adopted. If there is no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. have knowledge, though Dr. Hartman does in that book, Americans uh, from Wales, the, uh, what happened is that the Welsh who came as immigrants to this area, primarily to um, mine coal, brought with them a community, their, their own family and friends and neighbors, all often focused on a church which they would raise in that area, and they sought to preserve their culture, as indeed has happened with other immigrant communities. And the, uh, the Esteathwyd uh, became a, a, a centerpiece for that 